Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, I see that several people have joined uh, uh, from U UK, well, Europe, and uh, some from America, and mostly from India. Well, this is uh, a time, a difficult time, but then the difficulty has uh, brought people together. Uh, we are celebrating one such uh, togetherness. As you all know, cryo, TEM, and uh, related techniques have been growing globally. And this period especially is, uh, is a great time for applications of cryo. And you saw one such yesterday. Now, there are many other aspects of uh, electron microscopy which we all should be concerned about. And this today's speaker uh, brings to you that excitement of electron microscopy in other areas, especially into catalysis. I have heard him, uh, Professor Richard Palmer, a couple of times. In fact, he visits India. Uh, in fact, both these meetings were uh, his visits to India. We will, we have so, so far had, uh, today's is the uh, fourth lecture. We had three lectures before. We will be following up uh, this kind of lectures or taking them to other areas. And in December, we hope to conduct another series largely focusing on soft materials. In today's lecture, after this uh, 50 minutes of uh, lecture time, we will take some questions. If you have questions, please do write them down in the chat box we will have opportunity to, to ask questions directly. So please uh, be available to ask those questions. In case uh, some questions we don't have time to answer, we will be uh, responding to you through email. And if uh, it is okay with uh, Professor Palmer, we will uh, publish this or we will make this uh, video available for you and others who are not in a position to join now. With that introduction, uh, let me ask Amrita Chakraborty to introduce the speaker of today. Hello everyone. So uh, last three days we had excellent sessions with uh, Professor Yakaman, Dr. Maya Azobel and Professor Hendrik Dietz. And today we have excellent physicist, Professor Richard Palmer from Swansea University, United Kingdom. So in case you have missed any of these lectures, please visit our Facebook page. Uh, we are um, uploading the recorded videos there and feel free to circulate this among your circle so that everybody can have benefits. So uh, Professor Palmer has earned his doctorate degree in condensed matter theory from the Cavendish Laboratory, Cambridge in 1986. Then he was a research fellow in Cavendish Laboratory itself and Clare College, Cambridge until 1994. Dr. Palmer joined University of Birmingham as the professor of experimental physics. And there he, wa he was the head of nanoscale physics research laboratory. In 2014, he moved to Swansea University where he found the nanomaterials lab. Besides, Professor Palmer has been serving as the editor in chief of several journals like Advances in Physics, X, from the Taylor and Francis Public Publishing House, and Frontiers of Nanoscience, which is a book series from Elsevier. Professor Palmer has published more than 400 papers, which have been cited more than 13,000 times. The, his research focus is diverse and broad 
starting from atomic structure and dynamics of nano clusters and their studies via stem stem manipulation it goes all the way to catalysis biomedicine etc his dedication towards science and the contribution uh, in the scientific world has attracted many awards and honors starting from his uh, from the beginning of his career like he was awarded the pillai memorial prize for best result in natural sciences at trinity hall cambridge in the year of 1983 in 1996 charles vernon boys medal and prize of the institute of physics in 2010 he was awarded a honorary doctorate by hasselt university of belgium he was also elected fellow of the royal society of chemistry as as well as the learned society of wales he has also been a recipient of british Count vacuum council senior prize and john wirewood memorial medal we our group and a large part of material scientists today are working on nanoparticles and nanoclusters and the kind of science that is getting attention to these days require the cryo tem and stem largely so it will be extremely relevant and interesting to know professor palmer's findings uh, which he will be speaking about now his speech is titled as atomic structure metastability and dynamics of size selected nanoparticles probed by aberration corrected stem with this brief introduction let me request professor richard palmer to share the presentation Can you uh, see my presentation there? Yes. Yes. Okay, excellent. Well, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Uh, actually, it's an honor to be invited to the leading engineering college in India. I was quite impressed when I found that on the web. So congratulations on that. And of course, the fantastic laboratory of uh, Pradeep, you know, tremendous work you've been doing. So this first slide shows Swansea. This is my hometown to which I returned uh, three years ago. It's famous for its coastline and uh, tourism opportunities. And then down here you see uh, our College of Engineering. So this is the new College of Engineering of Swansea University. Uh, I guess it's number one in our country of Wales. And uh, it's got its own beach. So that's a pretty rare thing actually around the world. It's a nice place to work. So I've joined that effort and uh, hope to contribute something in the city of my birth. Now, I've got a couple of things to show you. Uh, first of all, here is my cup of tea. And the significant thing about this is it's the color of the Chennai Super Kings, okay? I'm pretty disappointed. We are sixth in the IPL. And uh, if you ask me, MS Dhoni needs to sort out the batting order because uh, Sam Curran from England, you know, he's a good all-rounder, but he shouldn't be opening the batting. So I really think they need to settle. They're not fulfilling their potential. I'm an expert on cricket, and I'm show showing you this. This is the Swansea School's cricket cap. So that's one of my proudest moments was to play for the city and county when I was younger. So I'm following the IPL with a great so hopefully that makes a, a connection with, uh, with some of you. I'm going so I'm going to talk about the atomic structure, the metastability and the dynamics of size selected nanoparticles. These are fundamental quantum systems of interest in their own right for a physicist like me. They're also highly relevant to uh, the biological applications area as well as the chemical applications area in catalysis. And in order to study them, I learned uh, how to do, or my group learned how to do, aberration corrected scanning transmission electron microscopy. And that will be the basis of the talk. So let me show you a first uh, image. Yeah. So this is one of our uh, nanoparticles. I won't say it's exactly typical. That is the most famous one we've produced. So this is eight nanometers across. It's a palladium nanoparticle on a carbon surface. 
And this is a functional catalyst. Palladium nanoparticles on carbon are used, for example, by the Johnson Matthey company that we collaborate with in catalysis. What the uh, microscope allows you to do is to see the individual columns of palladium atoms there. And the idea is that we want to correlate the atomic structure, which we hope to control with the chemical performance. Uh, but we're also interested in other applications. So we're interested, for example, at the moment in antimicrobial surfaces. And previously we've done extensive work using these nanoparticles to immobilize uh, proteins such as antibodies. And one of our spin-out companies is currently doing large-scale patient trials on a breast cancer test, a blood test based on an overexpressed antibody. And that derived from trapping proteins on a surface with the nanoparticles. The current focus, I think, is very much on catalysis. So there's a joke that goes with this. Okay, it's called the world's smallest valentine. I'm going to try the joke. I've not tried a joke on Zoom before, but anyways. It's only eight nanometers across. So if you give the world's smallest valentine to your loved one on Valentine's Day, it shows them just how little you love them. Okay. That's the joke. Pradeep is smiling. I think he's easy to please. So uh, clearly, even in a, a 45, 50 minute talk like this, one has to only skim the surface really. So um, if you're interested in finding out more about the nanoparticle method that I will talk about, uh, what we call the nanoparticle beam method and the route to catalysts and sensors. Uh, and if you're not in the field, here is uh, an accessible introduction from two years ago in um, accounts of chemical research called Synthesis Without Solvents. As you'll see, we also work on nanoparticles that are produced by chemical means, and I've included some uh, ligated clusters in the talk as well. But this is something that we do that not so many people do, so uh, I will give it particular emphasis. So let me start by briefly showing you how we make the samples and then come to the electron microscope studies. So first of all, I'll talk about the ultra precision method of mass selected cluster beam deposition. Uh, cluster means a cluster of atoms. It means essentially a small nanoparticle. So if I say nanoparticle or cluster or nanocluster, three terms meaning the same thing a nanoparticle, typically one to five nanometers in size is what we deal with. And mass selected means size selected. And this is the kind of apparatus that we would use. And uh, let me see if you can see the pointer. Can you see my pointer moving? Yeah. yeah. Fantastic, isn't it? Amazing technology. So this is a, a nanoparticle beam source. And in the chamber on the left, we make the nanoparticles. We have a target here say it's gold, and using a plasma, we vaporize that target, and hot gold atoms are emitted into a vacuum. And in the vacuum, they meet, as shown schematically here, cold argon atoms, and they condense. So the hot atoms condense in the cold gas to make nanoparticles. Some of them are charged, and we extract the charged particles here through the ion optics, into a mass spectrometer. I won't go into detail, it's our own design of mass spectrometer. And emerging then from this aperture onto the support is a beam of size selected particles. You can select to about one atom in 100, although we often select to one atom in 20 or 30 because there's a balance between transmission and resolution as usual. So if you want to do um, surface science type work, let's say square centimeters, maybe up to 10 or at the very most 100 square centimeters of sample. This kind of instrument is very good, very controlled. But if you think about the actual amount of material we're producing, it's about 0.1, maybe one microgram of clusters in an hour. So from the point of view of catalyst production, it's just nothing. So an instrument like this can be used for model studies, but we're also interested in moving towards manufacturing as I'll show you in a moment. So this is an example of uh, a cluster that was produced. This is sort of classic picture, gold 20. Gold 20 was predicted to be a tetrahedral pyramid. 
You can kind of see the triangular shape there in the aberration corrected microscope image. I'll come back to the technique in a moment. Uh, actually, these clusters fluctuate in time. So um, a system like this is highly fluctional. So at room temperature, in fact, this cluster inhabits frame by frame different structures. But the fact that we found the predicted ground state caused a certain amount of excitement. And the false color helps you with your images, that's for sure. Now, what's nice about the technique is that you make the nanoparticle, the cluster, in advance, and then you land it on the surface. And so you don't depend on nucleation and growth on a surface, which of course depends on the surface structure. So you pre-package the nanoparticle, and this is also true of the colloidal route, of course, prior to landing on the surface. And so you can decorate uh, polymers, plastics, paper, as well as metals and semiconductors. These are things that we do. Here's another example to show you that we don't just uh, make metal particles or elemental particles. This is two layers, a two-layer nanoparticle of a layer material, molydisulfide. It's supposed to be a platinum replacement candidate, but that's a difficult challenge, actually. This is a nickel-doped molydisulfide. So three different chemical elements in the nanoparticle. And this was used quite successfully for enhancing the hydrogen evolution reaction in electrocatalysis. So if you have a more complex target or targets, you can make more complex nanoparticles before you size or mass select them. So we have a vision. In the background there is the factory near where I used to work in Birmingham. That's where James Watt developed the steam engine in the 1750s in the first industrial revolution. And we have the idea of a nano factory, by which I mean uh, scaling up nano precision materials to useful industrial quantities. And we think that the nanoparticle beam method, if it can be scaled up, would be a valuable, very clean, green, and environmentally friendly method. So there are no solvents, and therefore there are no effluents. There are no toxic materials, no toxic salts, for example. And I think that's one of the reasons why our long-term collaborators in the Johnson Matthey Catalysis Company are quite interested in this technology, although there is a way to go uh, to turn it into a production tool. So, in the factory of the future, we imagine the incorporation of cluster beam deposition into the manufacturing process. Um, it's an environmentally sustainable method, as I said. We will, of course, need to integrate the nanoparticles into appropriate devices or materials. In the case of catalysis, that's normally fairly straightforward. It's the deposition of the nanoparticle onto powder particles of an oxide. So there are not too many steps compared with, say, making an integrated circuit. We will need a high level of characterization. That's the quality control in manufacturing terms. We need atomic precision in the uh, microscopy if we're dealing with a one nanometer particle. And we need to underpin this methodology by advanced materials and process modeling. And that's the vision underpinning our nanomaterials lab, which is established now and growing uh, at Swansea. And <clears throat> in November, we will open a satellite laboratory at Harwell. Harwell is a national lab outside Oxford, where the diamond light source, the synchrotron is. And we, we'll be locating one of our machines at Diamond, and that will become a satellite of our lab. So many applications for precise nanoparticles, whether you make them chemically or physically, uh, catalysis is our principal <clears throat> focus at the moment. I must have a drink of tea here. I've had a very nice fish and chip lunch. Now a cup of tea. Talk to friends in India. Perfect afternoon. So we can make catalysts. Uh, we're interested in decorating materials to make the surfaces antimicrobial for both bacteria and viruses. Neuromorphics is another area. You can assemble a brain-like architecture from nanoparticles, which can be used for computation. 
and pattern recognition. Gas sensors, photonics, water treatment is another one actually, which I know you're interested in. I'll just mention that at the end and various other applications. And the idea is we would have control of the composition and the size of the nanoparticle, the number we need to scale up. Crucial is the interaction between the particle and the support, and of course the response to the environment. And one of the things we're trying to do in all our fundamental studies, I mean, I'm coming from a physics background, now into an engineering department, where chemistry and biology are particular application spaces for us. Uh, it's important that we do the demonstration work and we always give attention to the performance validation. It's not my main focus today, but trying to study the performance of the materials in realistic environments, I think really adds strength to the work. So let me just uh, show you the method that we're using to scale up cluster production towards industrial levels. First of all, we asked our colleagues in industry, how much do we need to scale up by for industrial R&D? And to cut a long story short, they said five orders of magnitude, 10 to the power five. Um, there's a few people who are trying to work in that space. And I think Paolo Milani in Milan and we ourselves are, are leading on that. So the new machine I'll show you in a moment is designed for seven orders of magnitude scalar. Um, so that would be a gram of clusters per hour. I mean, it's still not a tremendous amount, but in catalysis terms where the metal loading is normally 1%, that's 100 grams per hour. You can make a kilogram of catalyst in a day. And that is sufficient actually for small batch manufacturing of pharmaceuticals. So I think that uh, industrial production is within range. Uh, this is the instrument. It's called the Matrix Assembly Cluster Source. And it's an idea I had in 2011, 2012, something like that. This particular instrument was one of the prototypes that demonstrated a scale up by uh, three orders of magnitude. And here's the concept. We take a plate. The plate is cooled to 10 Kelvin. We evaporate metal while introducing rare gas and we make a matrix of metal atoms in condensed rare gas. Now I showed you the traditional source and there the condensation of the metal atoms happened in the gas phase. Here we make the cryo matrix that's a much more dense and effective refrigerator which is what you need for condensing the metal atoms to make nanoparticles. But of course if you're at 10 Kelvin there's not much diffusion it's going to be a slow process and so we irradiate the matrix with the iron beam here, shown here, and that produces a cascade of collisions in the matrix, and it accelerates the rate of production of nanoparticles, which are then removed from the matrix and they make a beam. So in this prototype, you grow the matrix here, you move it into the second chamber, you irradiate with the iron beam, and the nanoparticles come off and they land on a carousel of 21 glass slides we were making uh, chips for uh, the biomedical area in this case. Uh, this shows you a schematic of the process. So although the metal atoms are not ordered, as shown here, it gives you an idea. The metal atoms are black, the matrix is white. The iron comes in, it produces a cascade of collisions, and in those collisions the metal atoms meet each other and nucleate into nanoparticles. And then in the next collision, more metal atoms are accelerated and the nanoparticle grows. And eventually the nanoparticle is knocked out here, sputtered, we say. That's how you make the beam. So it's based on multiple iron matrix uh, collisions. I mean, this is a very abstruse and original idea. Uh, a cryogenic matrix inside a vacuum chamber, but actually it does work as intended. In fact, it actually worked better than we thought really. And here's a, an illustration. These five images from the TEM show five films of uh, clusters. I think they're gold clusters. And as you vary the amount of metal in the matrix, so you vary the size of the cluster which is produced. That's kind of reasonable, isn't it? You have more metal in the matrix, more collisions, larger cluster. 
So you can tune the cluster size by the metal loading of the matrix. We dispense with a mass selection step because then we would just lose a lot of flux and we're trying to scale up. But we can achieve without mass selection, um, say 5%, plus or minus 5% in the diameter distribution. So that's very good by uh, synthesis, chemical synthesis terms in the range between uh, one or two and five nanometers. Now we know that uh, colloidal methods can produce precise nanoparticles now by chemical means such as ligated gold, but normally there is a filtering step in there. Anyway, we've got, a, we've got a good size control as far as catalysis is concerned. And we make the nanoparticles and deposit them on the support in a single step. And so that's quite attractive for manufacturing. Okay. I want to show you a little video here, because it's entertaining, of how a nanoparticle, which has already been grown in the matrix, can be sputtered out to join the beam. And this is from the Helsinki group. An iron has come in and it hits the nanoparticle, makes it hot, shown by the color. So the heat is then transferred into the matrix. The matrix, which is argon, starts to sublime. And the nanoparticle then sees an asymmetrical environment. So it's accelerated first down, and then you're gonna see it bounce off and out it goes and it becomes part of the beam. It wasn't obvious to us at the beginning that you'd be able to remove the nanoparticles like this from the matrix, but that seems to be a part of the process. And the simulations are really quite revealing, these atomistic classical electrodynamic simulations. This is the MAX-2, and this is the one which achieved the target five orders of magnitude scalar. And I think interesting is that at the bottom, there's this powder deposition cup, the powder stage it's under there. The cluster beam comes down and you can fill the cup with powder. That's a real catalyst support powder, one gram or now a hundred grams. And the powder is agitated by, uh, by mechanical agitation in order to sort of mix it up. So you expose all the grains to the incoming cluster beam. So you can get good coverage then over the whole of your powder inside the vacuum chamber. And this was the first sample of interest that we made. This was 1% silver loaded uh, onto to one gram of titania uh, on the right there. And uh, that is a catalyst powder, essentially silver on titania. At the bottom left there, you can see the deposition of clusters onto uh, PVP powder supports. You see the color change, which the customer likes to see. And uh, we also believe, although we haven't strongly studied this yet, that by mixing different metals in the matrix, um, silver gold at the top there or palladium gold at the bottom, we can produce alloy clusters, which may be um, uh, segregated as in the palladium gold case or random alloys as in the silver gold. So in fact this matrix, and some of you do chemical synthesis I think, this matrix is like your beaker, your flask, all right? You can think of the argon as your solvent and you can mix things together in here and then instead of stirring you hit it with an iron beam and you make your product. So you could mix different metals, you could introduce ligands, you could introduce proteins, for example. And uh, I think it would, it's an interesting chemical environment, almost like an interstellar gas. Something I didn't think about at the start, but I think that's promising for the future. Um, this, oh yes, if you want to look at some of the most recent work on catalysis, uh, this is uh, an article for the public, so it's accessible and references the recent paper. Uh, the website is called the QE Prize. We didn't win a prize, by the way. The QE Prize promotes science. And uh, this was uh, catalytically enhanced ozonation of nitrophenol in solution. So you want to remove 
some of the chemicals produced by the pharmaceutical industry from the water supply uh, and the ozone does it but if you use uh, oxide supported silver clusters you can enhance the rate of removal destruction basically of the uh, biochemical molecule Right, so that was a, a lengthy introduction, but I hope of interest because clearly your interests are in electron microscopy, but you will all bring something to that. You'll have your samples that you want to study, and I hope this overlaps with the interests of some of you. Okay, the atomic structure of clusters now by scanning transmission electron microscopy with spherical aberration correction. So these small clusters, and I'm talking about naked clusters now, not ligated clusters. Um, the atomic structure of these very small particles, typically a nanometer or 100 atoms in size, uh, is one of the fundamental problems in the science of nanoclusters. And these were first made in the beam. This was how carbon-60, the buckyball, was discovered, by the way, by Croto and Smalley. They were first made in the beam, and people did not actually know the structure in nearly every case. You can find innumerable theoretical treatments of the atomic structure of nanoclusters. The theory is far ahead of experimental measurements, actually. And the structure determinations, point three, are rather indirect. The most uh, powerful is the, where you trap the gas phase clusters in an ion trap and you do electron diffraction. But even there, they're rotating, okay? So it's like a powder diffraction method, essentially of gas phase nanoparticles. So if we can introduce new methods to get direct atomic and three-dimensional data on the structure of these nanoparticles, this is, has fundamental interest for the properties, but it will also um, provide a benchmark for all this theory that's been going on, all this theory without experimental benchmarks actually. And people, if you're not careful, you go to a talk and you think that this theoretical treatment um, this theoretical structure is the known structure because it's all that exists. Because there's been a, a vacuum as far as experimental structures are concerned. And so now, what lots of theorists, theorists are interested in the work we've been doing, and they are refining their potentials, for example, to match the experimental data. Ultimately, what we want to do, as we do in nanoscience in general, is correlate atomic precision structure with function. I mean, we're all trying to do that, right? So there's a, a list of the methods going from indirect methods of free clusters, where you measure spectra and you model uh, proposed structures and correlate the spectrum with what you measure, it's indirect. Moving down there, you become more direct to electron diffraction. And then we come to supported clusters and then you have a possibility for X-ray diffraction, which is so powerful, um, particularly if you have enough stuff. So that's been very powerful with the passivated, as I call them, or functionalized uh, clusters. And now electron microscopy, that's what I want to talk about. And we've been uh, involved in this for 12 years now, I think, on the leading edge. So we're doing um, scanning transmission electron microscopy. So that's a form of TEM in which you have a focused electron beam. The probe size without aberration correction um, is normally a bit under one nanometer, larger than an atom. If you uh, apply uh, aberration correction with the new lenses that people have developed and are now commercially available, you can get the probe size down to an angstrom or less, which is smaller than the size of an atom. So aberration correction makes a big difference if you want to see atomic structure. We detect electrons that are scattered at large angle, relatively speaking. It's called a high angle angular dark field. Uh, this is the instrument we used at Birmingham for the better part of a decade. So it's a spherical aberration, that's CS, spherical aberration corrected jail instrument operating at 200 kilovolts. Uh, that had to stay in Birmingham because it was regionally funded. In Swansea, we typically use the microscopes at Harwell, where, as I said, we're setting up uh, a satellite laboratory. There are two aberration corrected TMs there, which includes in situ work, actually. And next to those, 
there's a suite of cryo TEMs. This is in a facility on the synchrotron ring where there's also a focused X-ray beam with about a 20 nanometer spot size. And the idea is to correlate the electron microscopy with the X-ray imaging of both cryo samples and uh, material samples at room temperature. One of the great things about aberration corrected STEM is you have resolution of an angstrom or less as illustrated on the right there, but you also have very good sensitivity. So for a heavy atom like gold, you can see individual atoms, literally single atoms. Uh, this is on an oxide support. So you have a combination of sensitivity and resolution. So in relation to clusters, one of the fathers of the field was Jacques Friedel, the famous Friedel, as in the Friedel oscillations. And a long time ago, 1980, I found him saying in a conference proceedings when I was an undergraduate, one can also think of looking at the actual form of clusters of a few heavy atoms on light substrates by electron microscopy. Uh, but actually, it was quite a few years later uh, in fact, 28 years later, that uh, this came to pass with the work that we published in 2008. So he was a quarter of a century ahead of what was done experimentally, maybe what could be done experimentally. There are some images at the top of uh, size selected clusters, gold with 923 atoms, plus or minus 23. Those are three uh, frames from a video. I think I'm showing you the video later and then uh, gold 20 at the bottom that we've already seen. Um, this is showing you some of the uh, basics uh, of the physics of the electron microscopy, which I thought I would mention. And you're measuring electrons scattered through a large angle, and that scattering is incoherent. So normally in electron microscopy, right, you've got multiple electron scattering to account for. If you work in the dark field, it's more or less single electron scattering, so there's no interference. And that means that, uh, as you see on the right there, if we take clusters of different size, the intensity from the cluster is directly proportional to the number of atoms. You don't get interference effects. That works up to about 6,000 atoms. That's a very nice feature in terms of interpretation of your data. This is something that was known theoretically, and we've been able to use the size selected particles as a kind of calibration for the electron microscope scattering mechanism here in this uh, work that we did. And uh, there's a, an exponent, if you look at the expression for the intensity of the scattered electrons in the dark field, it depends on the atomic number Z to the power n. And people normally say n is 2, but it's not actually 2. It's 2 in Rutherford scattering, which is a very large angle. And by taking uh, samples, gold with 923 atoms, and the same with palladium, I'm measuring the intensity here as a function of the scattering angle, uh, we were able to calibrate the effect of the atomic number on the intensity, and that ratio is plotted here. So this is n. And the exponent is a function of the scattering angle. That's quite important to know. It goes towards two at large angle. But here at typical angles of the experiment, it might be about 1.4, 1.5, 1.6. This is relevant. If you're, for example, uh, studying a thiolated gold cluster, you've got carbon, you've got hydrogen, you've got sulfur, you might have some oxygen and so on, as well as the metal. This is telling you what is the contribution of each different atom to the intensity of the whole. And uh, it gives rise to a method of imaging called Z-contrast or Z-contrast in America. So this is a uh, gold core or gold rich core with a copper rich shell, core shell particle that we can make in the cluster source. And uh, if you look in more detail, uh, you see that you can distinguish the gold and the copper just from the brightness. So on the left, you have the gold in the center. The center is bright. 
On the right here, you've, we've made gold called copper shell, and you see a ring of brightness around the center, the profiles. So simply by looking at the intensity distribution, you can get with your eye your first impression of the structure. And of course, you can analyze these things quantitatively. Now, uh, I want to spend a bit of time on this. It's, it's not what we've done in the last two or three years, but I'm trying to give you here the story of about a decade uh, to introduce you to this aspect of electron microscopy. And one of the things that we did was to use size selected clusters from the beam as a reference for chemically produced uh, nanoparticles. So we take the TEM grid and on one side we deposit directly from the beam size selected gold clusters for example and on the other we deposit from our syringe we drop deposit the uh, colloidal nanoparticle uh, of in this case, potentially gold 144. I have to tell you in this case, I won't say where the sample came from, gold 144, so-called, contained between about 100 and 200 gold atoms. So you can count the atoms with reference to the size selected clusters with this method. Let me give you a nice example. The Schmidt cluster, one or two of you will remember, probably most of you have never heard of it, but it was very famous in the early days of nanotechnology, um, Gunther believed that he had produced chemically uh, size selected clusters, um, ligated gold clusters called the Schmidt cluster. So in this case, the Hamburg group reproduced the method. And what we're showing here is the number of clusters on the grid as a function of intensity using our size selected gold as, as the reference. And this is the chemically synthesized so-called gold 55. If you look at that gold 55 peak in more detail, you find there are actually four fractions. So the chemical method produced four fractions, the largest of which was size 55, but the other fractions were smaller fractions. So it's no wonder that some of the historical structure determination uh, has been, let's say, uncertain uh, in this area. We can mass segregate. So it's like, it's like using um, uh, a chromatograph, if you like, to separate the different fractions. That's the word I'm looking for. To separate the different fractions of the sample just by looking at individual nanoparticles one by one with the electron microscope and counting the intensity, which is proportional to the number of atoms. So we can take the sample and we can analyze each of those fragments. And if we take the gold 55, which people generally thought was icosahedral, we found that in just over half the cases, it was a glass actually. And in 42% of the cases, it had a hybrid chiral structure. It's rather an interesting structure. It's an icosahedron terminated by a close packed FCC plane. This was proposed by Garthon in Mexico City and it fits uh, remarkably well. And it explains why in bulk structure measurements previously, people had seen evidence for both icosahedral and FCC structures because the actual structure is a hybrid. Um, the way we're analyzing the data such as that is to compare the experimental images one of those is on the top right there, with what we call a simulation atlas. This is a method we introduced where you take your candidate structures, icosahedral, decahedral, FCC, that's the bulk structure of gold, and this hybrid chiral structure. And then you use um, a STEM simulation program, which allows for multiple scattering, although multiple scattering is weak. And then you calculate what the image will look like for all orientations of the nanoparticle. And that's shown here. So you turn it in two directions. And this allows us to get data from nanoparticles that are not necessarily aligned with a high symmetry direction. And we can also stick with the structure as the nanoparticle rotates under the beam, which is quite common. So now I'd like to focus on um, work with samples uh, made with our cluster beam source, but not as reference materials here. 
that has the systems of interest. So we'll talk about the atomic structure and metastability and dynamics of size-selected gold clusters. I think I've got just over 10 minutes left. Is that about right? Would somebody like to nod? Yes, about 10 minutes. Okay, so I'll speed up a little bit, but um, hopefully you'll find this interesting. This was our first um, hit, if you like. Uh, this was the Nature paper on the gold 309. That's how the data comes out, comes out as a kind of volcano plot. As a function of position, you have an intensity. The intensity is proportional to the column height under the electron beam. It's not strictly three-dimensional, it's two and a half dimensional information. So you're getting the projected uh, 3D structure. If you allow the particle to rotate under the beam, you can get um, three-dimensional information, actually, but that's another subject. You know. So uh, here we have um, gold 923. I wanted to show you the, the sensitivity. See, you can see on the surface of the individual nanoparticle, individual add atoms. This is a gold add atom, two, three, four. These are slightly larger gold nano clusters on the surface of the size selected gold 923 truncated octahedral structure. And from frame to frame, the core is stable here, but the surface atoms run around. I think that's quite interesting from a catalysis point of view. It means that when molecules come in to interact with the nanoparticle, they're seeing a surface in flux in this two nanometer particle, even if the core is rigid. It's something that's not normally considered in catalysis or in biological binding, is that the surface layer can be dynamic while the core is rigid. Now, if you look at gold 923, it's a so-called magic number, a closed shell of atoms. Um, if you look at the structure in detail, you may have mass selected, but it doesn't mean you've structure selected. You can have marks type decahedra, it's a special reconstruction of a decahedron here. You can have FCC structures, icosahedral structures, which have both fivefold and twofold axes. And these are the experimental data, and these are the simulations. So, for a heavy cluster like gold on a light support like carbon, the, the, actually you see the structure of the free cluster, which is what these are simulations of. And um, we study different sizes. And if you look at 309, 561, 742, that's magic, that's magic, that's magic, that's in between. You see that gold 309 shows a different proportion of the isomers from the images than the other three. But for the other three, the proportions are remarkably similar. And that's suspicious. What's happening in fact is that there's template growth going on here. So at size 309 in the cluster source, the nanoparticle is liquid. And you're adding more atoms in the condensation process and it can accommodate and then it freezes as it grows. Once you get to 561, it's solid. More atoms are added in the condensation process in a layer by layer fashion. And that uh, therefore the proportion of isomers is preserved. And simulations from the Ferrando group in Genoa strongly confirmed this picture of template growth. So um, when you make a nanoparticle, it can have different forms. You don't know from the outset whether that is an equilibrium structure or a kinetically trapped structure. And so we developed a method of using the electron beam to anneal the nanoparticles. So this is an icosahedron. It has a two-fold symmetry axis here size 923, and I'm going to run the video. The electron beam heats the specimen to about 100 degrees above room temperature. So it images and anneals at the same time. And what happens as the video goes on is you will see the emergence of a five-fold symmetry axis uh, in the center of the nanoparticle. Um, I think it's going to come fairly soon. There it is. At that point, it's transformed into a decahedron with the five-fold symmetry axis. 
So we've got a method now for working out whether the nanoparticle is metastable or stable. We do statistics on this. We took about 100 clusters. So we're not just um, getting a single image. This is something, of course, to be very careful of with electron microscopists. You have to be a bit suspicious of us because it's very easy to produce your best image. Um, but if, if you want faithful data representative of the sample, ask the microscopist to see it, you know, at least 100 nanoparticles in this case. What we found anyway was that all the icosahedra were unstable apart from one. They converted into decahedra or FCC, but the decahedra and the FCC were rather stable. And to cut a long story short, the icosahedron energetically is the least stable at this size, and it's, it's just trapped there kinetically. When you release the frustration by annealing, you produce the decahedra and the FCC. And these are very close in energy, very strongly competing with each other. There's another example here where we took a smaller size, 561, and we anneal the decahedra to FCC. And we study that. And then we took those insights uh, from the electron microscope images showing that some cluster structures are metastable with respect to others. And we fed that into the way we make the nanoparticles. So we, we said, okay, well, if the icosahedron is, is not very stable, then we give the system longer to equilibrate. Maybe we can produce another isomer instead. An illustration on the left here, we can get the FCC fraction up to 70% instead of 50%. So the vision is to produce size-selected nanoparticles and also atomic structure-selected nanoparticles. And then you present this to your catalytic reaction and you optimize the catalysis according to both size and atomic configuration of the nanoparticle. Um, I think for this last example, I'll be showing you some high temperature work. So what we've done now, rather than go cryo, we go hot. We use one of these new stages, a MEMS-based stage in the electron microscope, which can be heated up remarkably to a thousand degrees above room temperature while retaining the atomic resolution. It's so stable. And a couple of papers that have emerged uh, in recent years from this work. Um, imagine I have two of these isomers, two of these alternate structures. Imagine that the, um, as for gold 561, imagine that the face-centered cubic of the magic number cluster is more stable than the decahedron, okay? But as things grow, they can be kinetically trapped. We might have lots of decahedra. If we can anneal the system, what happens is you heat the higher lying state over the barrier, it falls down here, and we consolidate in the ground state. If you then keep on heating, by equilibrium, by the Boltzmann factor, you start to repopulate the higher lying state, not now as a kinetically trapped state, but as an equilibrium structure. And if we could measure the proportions of these isomers versus temperature in a Boltzmann, uh, in an Arrhenius plot, we can get this energy. So for the first time, we'd be able to measure the energy offset between two different architectures in the nano space. So it's technical, but quite a big deal actually. The potential energy surface regulates the nano system, controls everything. You know, when you apply temperature, light, etc. But normally it's, it's the uh, province of theorists if we can measure critical parameters such as barrier heights, then we really start to understand the system experimentally. So uh, I'll show you this video. Look on the right, look at this particle here. We're heating up, it's decahedral, becomes FCC, becomes amorphous, becomes decahedral, becomes FCC again, becomes decahedral. Here's the temperature, 300 degrees. So we can take clusters of different size and we can watch them evolve with temperature. And very often they fluctuate. If we go to still higher temperatures, watch this one. We can watch it melt. We find rapid shape fluctuations here. 
which correspond to surface melting of the nanoparticle and then the core melts subsequently. We can plot the proportion of isomers, which I just mentioned to you. Let's just look at the ratio. The ratio of decahedra to FCC as a function of temperature. First of all, the ratio collapses. That's because we're annealing out the kinetically trapped decahedra. But then we start to warm up further and now we repopulate the decahedral minimum. And if we plot the same data on a 1 over t Arrhenius plot, the slope of this curves, curve gives me the energy difference between these two minima. So it's a first measurement. And uh, this is from the Nature Comms paper, some theory later by Anna Garden in New Zealand. The energy difference between the two isomers was only 40 milli electron volts, 0 0.04 electron volts. <clears throat> in future, if we make the same measurement, but we measure the by video imaging at different temperatures, the rate of transformation between these two isomers, we can get these activation barriers. This height from the top to the bottom, as opposed to this height. Uh, and that will regulate the kinetics then as well as the thermodynamics. We'll have a handle on that. This is the melting. We're proposing in this work a new definition of surface melting in which rapid shape fluctuations, they're quite wild actually in the video, are the signature of surface melting of the nanoparticle. We can measure that for different sizes. And what we've been able to do here is distinguish between the melting of the core and the melting of the surface of a nanoparticle, which is only two nanometers in size. We can distinguish that. I don't have time to show you all the simulations, but I'll just give you an indication. The gold 561 here, this is the temperature where the surface melts, the different samples. These are the points where the core melts. And there is um, a region, a coexistence region of up to 300 degrees in which the surface of the gold nanoparticle, two nanometers in size, is melted and core is solid until we get to the melting of the core itself. So this dynamic electron microscopy gives you real insights into the real time metastability and dynamics of these nanosystems, which is going to be going on, for example, during a catalytic reaction or during the binding of a protein. As these events are happening, so is this dynamics. Uh, I will skip the sintering, um, but and I'm skipping completely the reaction data. But what we've done with these systems is we then take these nanoparticles into a reaction environment. Broadly speaking, they're fantastic catalysts, to put it simply, because of their precision, uh, because of the size definition, they are looking very good in all the tests that we've done. So if we can scale up, it looks quite promising for future catalysis. A problem in catalysis is sintering. And what we've been doing is taking TEM grids with the nanoparticles on and subjecting them to reaction conditions and looking at sintering mechanisms. And for example, in the CO oxidation reaction, as a function of size, we get a transformation from this kind of sintering here. This is a size distribution for this kind of sintering here. This is called Oswald ripening. This is called Smolachowski ripening, where nanoparticles retain their integrity, but they diffuse and aggregate. This is where nanoparticles break up and atoms are exchanged. And the boundary between these two regions as a function of size corresponds to the onset of the chemical activity. If a nanoparticle is small enough to become active catalytically, the heat of reaction drives a different sintering mechanism. You can inhibit sintering by adding to the nanoparticle um, inhibitors. So here we take gold, we add some titanium. The titanium binds to the oxide surface and slows down the sintering of the two nanoparticles shown very relevant to catalysis. Okay, sorry I had to go uh, quickly through the end, but I don't want to bore you for too long. Um, I, I acknowledge the colleagues, you saw their names on the corners of the slides as we went along. I want to thank them. 
and, and of course our many collaborators such as the theory collaborators I've mentioned uh, the sponsors and thank you very much for listening it's been a really interesting exercise to speak to you I hope some of you are still awake now we can have some discussion thank you thank you <clears throat> it's a, a fascinating tool through the structure and dynamics of uh, of small species and how they they in fact contribute to chemical reactivity although you didn't really get into that but that is that is uh, really fascinating how this goes now uh, we have a few questions here i would like people to write down their questions and we will uh, take them one after another but to get uh, this started let me ask the following that of course electron uh, beams have become smaller and smaller resolutions have uh, become better and better uh, and so at some point in time you should be in a position uh, to look at the vibrational dynamics of these systems of this or related systems and if that happens you are not only seeing structure uh, of this kind but also doing spectroscopy of that essentially understanding the various kinds of modes which take the system from one structure to the other will it be possible i mean that's a fantastic vision um there are some projects uh, there's one in the uk at the super stem lab at uh, darsbury in the northwest of england uh, where they are seeking to do vibrational spectroscopy um, with appropriately monochromated aberration corrected electron microscopy. There is typically a trade-off though between the energy resolution and the spatial resolution at the moment. So it's possible to achieve um, tens of milli electron volts resolution. Now, if you compare that with Raman infrared or even high resolution electron energy loss spectroscopy, which I used to do, it's pretty poor actually. So it can look at high lying modes like uh, CH modes, for example, in principle. Um, phonon modes are maybe up to 30 millivolts in a metal. You might just get into that region. But at the moment, there's no suggestion you can do that with, with the atomic resolution that we've come to love. So that's the state of the art at the moment. Um, it's a brilliant idea to do vibrational spectroscopy with, with single atomic column uh, precision, but it, it's not possible uh, quite yet. Good question. Thank you. Good. Um, let's um, go over to these questions. Uh, Dr. Vijay Raghavan, uh, you have a question. Yeah. Uh, Professor, good evening. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I enjoyed the lecture. Uh, I have a question. Suppose I have clusters of gold say some size uh, prepared by chemically and physically physical methods how does the reactivity compares uh, uh, the same clusters of gold or any metal prepared chemically and physical yeah. methods suppose yeah well that's a really that's a really good question actually um so it's a live uh, in terms of the catalysis uh, when we speak to our catalysis colleagues and our friends in industry, they quite like the fact that we have ligand free nanoparticles. In general, ligands inhibit the chemical activity if they're still attached to the nanoparticle. Okay? On the other hand, there are situations, particularly for more complex reactions, in which the ligands can actually guide the entrance and exit channels. Uh, for the molecules. So we have several colleagues who would like to work with us to take our nanoparticles and then functionalize them. So we could directly compare a size-selected cluster, so let's say with 100 atoms, before and after you functionalize it. Okay. And see how that affects the catalysis. Um, at the moment, I, I'm not aware, actually, that there are any serious studies which compare directly a mass selected naked cluster with okay. a chemically prepared chemically, okay. cluster. Certainly they're going to be different. I mean, the ligands are going to have a profound effect. Some sure. people rip the ligands and 
in principle, you can make the naked cluster that way. And I would expect if you've got the same size cluster with a similar atomic structure, it won't, its chemical activity will not reflect its history. But that's pretty much where we are at the moment. Okay, thank you, sir. thank you. Thank you. Uh, Vishal, you have a question. Vishal, are you there? Hello, hello. Uh, are you getting my voice, sir? Yes. Hello, Vishal. Uh, yes, sir. It's a very nice presentation. Uh, I just wanted to ask, like, the process uh, looks very similar to uh, uh, this ion implantation methods that uh, metallurgists use, where these ions go and then get uh, they get doped uh, in uh, different materials. So I just wanted to know, instead of uh, like when you bombard these noble gases. Uh, onto the substrate instead of going to the these sites so why these uh, uh, clusters came out a sputtered cluster is is this something related to the thickness like uh, if we have a very thin substrate and then we bombard then uh, we get these clusters means effect of thickness on the and the bombarding ions mm. uh, and its relation to the this clusters that is coming i wanted to know so I think, I think you're thinking about my max method where I was bombarding the matrix uh, with the iron beam. Um, yes, yes. Right. So first of all, as you rightly say, you can take an iron beam, a gallium, for example, uh, and you can directly implant those ions inside another material, such as a semiconductor. What you normally do, if you want to make nanoparticles inside the material, you normally have a thermal processing step afterwards. Because if you implant an iron, there is a damaged track and you have statistically isolated uh, atoms then. And then you normally thermally process in order to produce nanoparticles of different sizes. Uh, what we are doing is generating and liberating the nanoparticles by using this cryo matrix, which is kind of quite original. So um, the metal atoms are in a kind of solvent, if you like a light solvent of rare gas inert atoms. And uh, as far as the thickness is concerned, you're quite right. If the matrix is very thick, uh, when the iron beam comes in, it will only liberate clusters from the surface it hits. In other words, in reflection, we call that the reflection mode. Sometimes we work with a very thin matrix and we work in the transmission mode where the nanoparticles come out the opposite side. And sometimes we work in the reflection mode where they come out the same side. And that's because there is a range where the incoming ion is stopped by the matrix. Now that range is much longer in a rare gas than it would be in silicon, for example. But you can't have, you know, a thick layer of 10 microns, for example, of argon and expect to get clusters coming out on the far side. So that's a good insight, yeah, good uh, analogy there with the iron beam implantation. Thank you, Visha. Uh, thank you, sir. If you have uh, reactive um, atoms, like a carbon and a metal, would you get to different kinds of carbides? Yeah, I mean, this is really fascinating. And I'm, you know, one of the reasons why we're kind of eager to promote and collaborate with people on this is the the spectrum of possibilities is enormous, right? So we could introduce uh, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen into the matrix together with the metal atoms and produce uh, oxides, carbides, and nitrides, and maybe control the stoichiometry and produce unnatural stoichiometries. Um, that would be very, very interesting. Yeah. And then gradually, probably, you lift off uh, uh, the matrix, and maybe you, you should get 2D material. Or I don't know what all possible. Uh, I just slightly lost your sound there, Pradeep. Could you say that again? Uh, I'm saying that uh, if you have this matrix now, you have put oxides or carbide or metal and carbon, maybe it is also possible to create 2D material or other dimensionalities. <laughs> yes. Inside the matrix, maybe. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it'll come to a size where you're not going to sputter them out anymore, of course. And I, it was quite interesting for us to see that a cluster as large as a thousand atoms yeah. 
could actually be sputtered out of the matrix by the mechanism that I showed. But there will, there will come a point where it's too heavy and it will just... Uh, sure, sure. Let's go to Lou Xavier. You have a couple of questions or one question? Only one question. Um, great talk, Professor Richard Palmer. Um, I have a question on imaging clusters while they are flying, uh, while sputtering. Like, in principle, it's possible to do this with X-ray free electron lasers, like, because they are a highly, I mean, yeah. they have very high flex. When we hit a single cluster, it will produce a diffraction pattern and we can image them. And it yes. will be particularly useful in studying the transient dynamics in the femtosecond and attosecond time scale. Have you given any thought about it? Uh, no, I, I, what you mentioned is very interesting. So um, some of the people who are involved in building cluster sources with us, and our work is entirely to do with deposition, reflecting my background in surface science, uh, but they also do gas phase work. Uh, yes, Bernstein yes. is an example, mm -hmm. who takes his clusters to places like, uh, like Bessie and, and Daisy. And as yep. you said, you've got the ultra-fast laser experiments and you've got, also you can do the electron diffraction type measurements yeah, true. in the beam. Um, I think the, the X-ray work at the moment is, is largely for bigger clusters. I mean, you need a signal, right? Yes, it is. But yeah. uh, given that you have 1,000 atoms, it must be possible. And yeah. the pulse yes. energy now, it's going to around 10 millijoules per pulse in, at the European yeah. X-ray laser. Yes. It, it should be possible. Like it's uh, better than LCLS now. Yeah, I find, I, I find it fascinating. It's not my own topic, but certainly be very interesting to, to get that data. And I mean, as somebody who does deposition for materials, yep. and the, the more reference data we have, particularly experimental data mm -hmm. on the free clusters, the better, because that's part of the nanomaterials design process. Yeah, right. And if you're doing deposition, maybe in the lines of work, Klaus Kern in Max Planck Stuttgart, um, they do ion molecular beam deposition on graphene and do inline holography. I mean, okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> so, well, like, do you have any idea in that direction? Uh, we, we work with two dimensional materials and we deposit nanoparticles onto them. I, mm -hmm. I did my PhD on the surface of graphite. Oh, great. I'm familiar with the concept of graphene long before it became famous because all the theoretical modeling of graphite actually used graphene because graphite was too hard. Mm -hmm. So I've, I've done work actually on uh, um, plasmons um, at what they call the Dirac point of graphite myself back in the day. Mm -hmm. And now we're depositing experimentally and we do some theoretical work on metal clusters on graphene, which is an interesting catalyst support. Uh, and also, we, of course, uh, gas sensing is another thing you can do. So if you've got a two-dimensional material, you want to expose it to gas, and you want to use that for detection of the gas, but the, the molecule's got to interact, maybe it doesn't stick. So you can put a nanoparticle on the 2D material, yes. and catalytically, essentially enhance the electronic conductivity when the molecule arrives for um, an electronic nose application, for example. Well, uh, lots of possibilities are there, Lourdes, and people do look at um, uh, trapped ion electron diffraction, especially of these kinds of clusters. But then what you said is really fascinating. On the fly, uh, can we do uh, diffraction? But yeah, there this, are, is, yeah. this is in oh. fact my PhD project. <laughs> I do single particle imaging on the fly. You know, no, I am talking about this when it comes to this kind of uh, the process that uh, uh, Professor Palmer talked about. When things fly during that time, especially as you said, uh, seeing the changes uh, by diffraction within that kind of time scales, I do not know the uh, particle velocities or, uh, in, in this, but then that's all really fascinating. Of course, there are plenty of things to do, and uh, in case you have questions, please do uh, write to Professor Palmer. He would be happy to respond to you. Now I hand over this, uh, the screen, and <laughs> no, I can't say my screen uh, to Amrita. Uh, thank you, Professor Palmer, for this very informative talk. I'm sure this is very inspiring for uh, young minds um, who is planning to work or working in this direction. 
and i will like to thank all the participants for being with us uh, throughout and uh, asking interesting questions and make this entire thing uh, successful so um, i will invite invite all of you to our uh, next session so this today was the last uh, last lecture of this session of uh, the lecture series on cryo em but we will be having more uh, more uh, scientists talking about in uh, in this area maybe in december so i invite all of you uh, to join us then also uh, it will be announced and uh, yeah i think uh, we should conclude this now on a happy note <laughs> so thank you all thank you thank you very much thank you